Daniel Jeremiah, NFL Network analyst, uh, former NFL scout, NFL Network providing live coverage, rounds two and three tonight, starting at 7 Eastern. And then they'll have uh, rounds four through seven on Saturday, starting at noon Eastern. And uh, Daniel Jeremiah joins us in the uh, New York loft. Uh, welcome. The um, Blake Bortles to Jacksonville. No one had him going there. How did they hide it so well? I'll give you a quick backstory there, Dan. I've I've known Dave Caldwell for a long time. I've been doing this media thing here for two years, so it was in the scouting side. He's a he's a really good friend. So I call him yesterday and I said, Dave, I'm just going to go through some guys that you could pick, and then just tell me why they fit with your team. And then after he gets picked, I can talk about it on the air and say this is why they took him. And Dave Caldwell is the GM, GM of the of Jacksonville Jag Jaguars. Yeah. So. And I, I've been thinking all along here, it's going to be Mac or Sammy Watkins. So those are the first two guys I ask him about. We talk about them. Then I said, well, you know, maybe Mike Evans if Sammy Watkins goes. So I talk about Mike Evans. And I said, all right, well, let's, let's talk about some of the quarterbacks. Johnny Manziel. So we, he gives me his spiel on Johnny Manziel. And right when he finishes, he goes, DJ, I, I got another call. I got to run, but I'll have to call you back. So we never talk about any other quarterbacks. So I just called him back about 10 minutes ago. Dude, you didn't have another call. He's like, man, I didn't want to lie to you. I didn't want to lie to you. <laughs> Do you respect that? I did. I said, hey, you, so you didn't lie to me. You just didn't want to talk about it. But I was like, you got to be, at least be straight with me. You didn't have anybody on the other line. No. Was it the right choice? Well, he had an interesting take on it. He was like, look, we, we kind of want to use this situation like Phillip Rivers and Drew Brees where he can sit. And when they feel like Henny can play, they can use him next year. Yeah. He's into it. He's already done his homework on next year's quarterback class, and he felt like even those guys were probably going to be a year away. So if you wait to draft a guy next year, now you're having to wait another year before your guy gets on the field. So that's kind of the thinking behind the pick. Interesting. Interesting. Uh, Manziel falling. Bortles shook up the first, yeah. first round. Absolutely. Right? Well, the fact that Bortles went there, I didn't think Oakland had a shot at Mac, which they ended up getting him. Tampa didn't have a shot at Mike Evans, who they wanted. They ended up getting him. Aaron Donald going all the way down to 13. To the, I mean, it just it hooked everybody up down the line. Did you think Dallas was going to take Manziel? No, I, I didn't because they're always in win now. It's always about next year, win now. Last three QBs they drafted, I mean, talking about Stephen McGee, you're talking about Isaiah Stanback and then Quincy Carter. They haven't made a habit of drafting Chad Hutchinson, they had him too. Baseball player yeah. at Stanford. yeah. yeah. But Manziel slipped to 22 because of what? Well, I think when you talk to people around the league, everybody liked Johnny Manziel. But the hard thing is with in these mock drafts, which we've talked about before, they're, they're ridiculous. The, the tough thing about that is how do you translate like into the conviction to turn in the card? And I think that becomes a little more difficult. Did the Browns have a good draft? I think so. I, I think they did. I mean, Mike Pettin, he wants, he wants to get up. And he wants to be a pressure defense. you got to have a bunch of corners to do that. Now you have Gilbert with Hayden. That's a pretty nice start. And then uh, and then you circle back in and get your quarterback. They still have a, a, some more picks here to see what they do. Pick 35 will be interesting. Then you had the Vikings sneaking back in to get Teddy Bridgewater. I like that. Was, was Houston going to take Teddy Bridgewater if he was there today? I don't know that, but, I mean, obviously they're in the quarterback market. Yeah. So why why risk it if you like him and you feel good about him? But don't you think Minnesota knew? I mean, you go up because you want to get a guy, but you want to make sure there's somebody up there that doesn't get that guy that you want. Yeah, you're always looking at that. You always had somebody in the draft room when I was with teams that was responsible for kind of knowing, you know, the needs and kind of they monitor who goes to these pro days, who does private workouts, and I'm sure they felt there was a significant enough interest with Houston that let's just go get him. Do we screw up the mock drafts or the regular draft with our mock drafts? Because we're not, you know, talking to teams, understanding what they need. So we project on who's the best player. Teddy yeah. Bridgewater was going to be the number one pick. How many months ago? Uh, Manziel was going to be up. Like, we weren't quite sure on some of the other picks there, but we put it out there, the media. And then the teams do their homework. And then all of a sudden, the media then looks bad because the teams do something different. So is it, the you know, the dog... The tail wagging the dog here with the media? Well, I think even the teams don't know, you know at that point in time that the media is guessing and the teams would be guessing. They haven't done all their due diligence on all these guys. Well, there's so, mock drafts yeah. now for next year. It's already started. Oh, yeah, I'm sure they're, I'm sure they're out McLovin there. McLovin has his mock draft for next year. Uh, not up yet, but soon. Who's your wow. number one pick next year? I go off the board, Bryce Petty out of Baylor. <laughs> okay. Yeah, you got to start. Keep in mind, he's saying that with no pants on. I know. He has a Manziel jersey <laughs> and no pants. Yeah. Wait till you see him uh, in 10 minutes. He's, I'm making him wear his mock draft out on the street.
Oh, of course. Yeah, so nice. he's, it's like a... It's like, a billboard. Yes, it's like a, a sandwich uh, thing that you put on. You know, so he's going out there, <laughs> and he's going to walk around, and we're going to mock his mock draft. We're talking to Daniel Jeremiah of the NFL Network, joining us uh, in the New York City Man Cave. Mike Florio will join us coming up. Who had the best uh, night last night? Well, I mean, the teams with multiple picks, you know, you could obviously say them, but I'll, I'll tell you the team that nobody's talking about, which is kind of ironic, is Houston. They got the best player in the draft. Yeah. And, and we, the, from the first time we talked about it, said they have to take him. Yeah. You can't pass on him. But the system that they play. Don't, don't worry about it. They'll, they'll figure it out. I mean, I, I just look at San Francisco as the model with Justin Smith lined up next to Alden Smith. You put those guys next to each other and just, just let Clowney stand up and rush. I don't think you're going to ask him to do a whole lot of dropping, but putting them next to each other, that's going to be tough to block. Well, you're also going in that division. You're going against Andrew Luck, so that's probably going to be the team that you got to outscore yeah. him, or you got to hit him, and they're going to try and hit him. Well, Donovan McNabb was on yesterday with Marshall Falk, and they both said it's about offense. And I said everybody has an offense. The great teams have a great defense. Defense to me wins championships. You can score in this league. The rules are there for you to score. Are you seeing teams building their defense based on what they saw with Seattle and maybe San Francisco when the Ravens won the Super Bowl? That those defenses, certainly with Seattle last year, San Francisco the year before. I, I think everybody's trying to copy Seattle. When, when you look at that formula. What is a copycat league? Uh, yeah, exactly. It's a copycat league and everybody's doing it. And you just look inside their division in this draft. You look at the Seattle safeties. They're, they're so impactful. You got Earl Thomas who can kind of float over the top. And you have Cam Chancellor who's a hammer. So now you look at Arizona. They already had Tyran Matthew, who's kind of their Earl Thomas. So they go draft Dayon Buchanan, who's a big hitter, to be their Cam Chancellor. You look at the 49ers. They have Eric Reed, the big safety. What do they do? They go draft a little Jimmy Ward, the safety, who's athletic and can play over the top. So I think that Seattle influence is running pretty deep. The guy you can guarantee will be an all-pro out of this draft. The guy I feel best about probably uh, is Greg Robinson. It's amazing. I talked to two people, former players, and they just – couldn't believe how his footwork is incredible. And he's massive. Like, he, you, most tackles when you're around him, they're kind of tall, narrow guys. He looks like Willie Rofe. And Willie Rofe oh, was just, yeah. he looked like a jumbo guard, you know, because he's just so wide. Uh, that's what Greg Robinson is. I mean, I, I just said, people ask, how do you describe him? It's, it, he's a people mover. That, that's all he does. He just moves people <laughs> a you, lot. If I look at the ceiling for Clowney and Manziel, how high is it for both of them? And how low is it? Oh, I think I think Clowney has a higher ceiling by a good margin, and I think Manziel has a much lower floor. But now he's I, – I saw where he's underrated because he went 22 overall. If he had gone three to Jacksonville, now he's overrated if he doesn't do well. I think you're a first-round pick. You're a first-round pick. The pressure's going to be there. He looked like he was really nervous hiding from that pressure when he walked out on stage, too. <laughs> okay, he doesn't start right away in Cleveland, right? I don't know. Hoyer, if Hoyer's not healthy – you talk about hearing a push for somebody to start. I mean, oh, it's going to be. But this, I, I liken this to Russell Wilson. When he went to Seattle, he was just too good to Couldn't keep, keep him, him on out. the bench. Yeah. But here's Manziel who goes in, and it's more of the hype that you can't keep him on the bench. So I don't know if it's playing talent as much as it is what the potential is and the fact that this is, you know, ratings grabber. This, this is something that the team, he's our face now. I think it's all going to come down, and everybody, you know, we talk about the preseason games being meaningless and there's no reason to watch. There would be a lot of people watching those Cleveland preseason games because if he does play well, even if it's vanilla defense and it's a lot of backups on the field, good luck keeping him off the field. I like Marquise Lee. I liked him a lot. So do I. But um, is he one of, the, one of the steals in the second round? Is he that good to be labeled a steal in the second round? I think so. I think I have him as like my 22nd overall player. Yeah. So you're getting him in the in the second round. You're getting a good value. The problem with Marquise is when you look at first round receivers, usually you either have rare size or rare speed. And Marquise is 5'11". He ran low 4'5". So you don't really check those boxes. And you put the cards up on the wall, Dan, in the draft room. It's it's height, weight, speed. And you sit and look at those things, meeting after meeting after meeting. And, and, and it can get you a little messed up. But we get in trouble with that, Daniel. Absolutely. Every year we get in trouble Oh, he's 6'3", and he's, you know, 230, and he ran a, I just want to know if you can play. And, and you, you were an NFL scout. Who was the guy that you looked at and you said he had, he had everything? He just he didn't have it. He, didn't, he couldn't play. Was there somebody that you scouted where you said, and maybe it puts you in a tough yeah. position here. In terms of he had everything, but he just didn't have that it. If you went by what well, you I'll did tell, on I'll the draft you. board, by I'll height, and weight, and, uh, you know, 40-yard dash. Well, I mean, I, I wasn't there when we picked him. I came right after that. But if you look at Kyle Bowler, 
and just watch the height, weight, the speed, great kid, hard worker, all that stuff. And but he wasn't an accurate quarterback. And uh, well, I think that they what, what they talk about the pocket being muddy. Yeah. You know when that happens. That that is the big is that a big difference? You know that that, that if you look at that, Brandon Whedon wasn't good yep. when the pocket was like that. Is that a big issue when you guys are breaking down tape of what they do when there's pressure on right in your face? Absolutely, and you, I mean, Brandon Whedon could not any throws if you watched him. Anytime he had to get off his spot, shuffle his feet, and throw the football, his accuracy went in the toilet. And I remember one play; he's rolling out to his left, and you know, as an athlete, you should be able rolling out to your left, square your shoulders, and throw the ball. He had to completely flip his feet to get in a comfortable throwing position. When I saw that, I was like, "There's that's not going to work. But how do you take him? You know, wasn't Mike Holmgren there? Yeah. Doesn't he know quarterbacks? Yeah, but it's the toughest position to evaluate in sports. I mean, you, you get enamored with certain things. And you, with Whedon, you had a guy with, with the arm strength and the size. And he's somebody else that when you get into the postseason you know, portion of things and you're watching guys go out there and throw workouts, they look great. All right, give me the guy today, tonight, that uh, we should focus on. Whether he doesn't get drafted or he would be somebody you look at and say somebody got a bargain. Timmy Jernigan from Florida State. Well, know. he was a first rounder. Yeah, I mean, he's my 18th overall player. So. Was the testing positive for? Didn't help him, I'm sure. <laughs> but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, usually, I don't think it can help nah, you. Not you a know, big if, help. If it's medicinal marijuana, then maybe say, oh, okay. Um, it, I, we talked about this too about quarterbacks. If you test positive, Zach Mettenberger yep. had a diluted sample. How much of a red flag is that if it's a quarterback who tests positive at the combine? I think it is. I mean, we always talk about the character positions kind of being up the middle of the field because that's where your leaders come from in football, and that's quarterback, center, middle linebacker, safety. Those guys kind of run your team. Um, so there, at those positions, character carries a little more weight. Now, the diluted sample, what that's going to do is it's going to cause people to go back and look at the rest of his background, and it's either going to confirm or they're going to feel comfortable that, you know, that was legit. Why is this stuff uh, made public? I don't know. I, I don't know who pushes it out there. I mean, I, I, that's what the whole, the whole Wonderlick thing. I tweeted the week before the draft uh, on, you know, just watch over the next week. You'll see Wonderlick scores, failed drug tests, and you'll hear about horrible team visits. It always comes out the week before the draft. He's Daniel Jeremiah. He's uh, with the NFL Network. They did a great, Rich, Rich Eisen did a great job last night. Although I think Mayock was tipped on the Bortles pick, Daniel. You think so? Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Him and Berman. Berman did the same thing. It, we, it could be. A little birdie told me it could be. Yeah. By the way, Dan, you're, you're such a veteran in this business, an icon. Last night, as a newbie in this, I'm sitting there up in that little orchestra pit. They come down for this quick little hit. And, and I'm getting halfway through. Throw it to the commissioner. Throw it to the throw it to the commissioner. What? <laughs> so I kind of I get halfway through. I thought, well, all right, let's take a look. Let's head it over to the commissioner. At the and I looked, and he's walking right behind my right behind me. So he's going up for a pick. Yeah, he was going up oh. for a pick. You don't want to miss that. Well, it's weird when they're talking to you. What it, what is called your earpiece, your mm -hmm. IFB, and you can be on the air talking. Somebody's talking to you, and you don't even know what you're saying now because you're listening to your producer <laughs> say. All right, uh, wrap this up and then uh, send it to the commissioner with the next pick. And then you want to say, I'm going to wrap this up and send it to the commissioner. <laughs> I might have done that. I haven't seen it yet. Uh, thanks for stopping by, Daniel. Thanks, and uh, thanks for your contributions the entire season. We enjoyed it. The NFL Network analyst.